I think viewers on one hand wants to, want to see expression. That's why I love to see a brush stroke with trippy paint. On the other hand, I'm always very confused that do you want your car to look like that? So on one hand, we want to see expression, but at the time, we also want to see perfection. So I think with my work, if, if you look really closely, you'll see expression, but, but it's also it's perfect like a car. My name is Robert Longo. I'm an artist. Um, I live in New York. I'm very lucky to be an artist. I don't know what else I would do. I was lucky enough to... Um, a lot of things I tried to do, I, I thought I wanted to do, I failed at. Um, I wanted to be a musician, then I wanted to be a, a marine biologist because I always loved surfing. And, and, um, but I always remembered I could always draw. So I thought maybe I'd become an art major. And then I flunked out of art school. And then I went to night school to try to get my life together. And there, I had this really great art teacher who said, don't you want to be an artist? And I said, N no, I, just, I don't think I have the courage to be an artist. So she said, why don't you become an art historian or learn how to conserve, conserve conservationists? So she helped get me a scholarship to Italy and I went to Italy to, in the early 70s to learn restoration of paintings. And there was a really crazy woman in Florence who was yelling at everyone, saying how they were, were destroying everything. And it turned out she's the woman that um, restored the Last Supper. So she had a very different idea. Anyway, so I quit that school and I took my books and I traveled around Europe and studied art. And then I went back to New York and went back to school. My degree was in sculpture, and but the thing is that I always drew, so drawing is like the basis of everything. It, all, all real good art, or I think most good artists can draw. And drawing is not, it's about looking. I don't, I don't think people understand that drawing is not just the ability to draw, but it's the ability to look and process what you're seeing to draw it. So, you know, somebody says draw something, you have to either have it in your head that you've looked at. You can't draw something that you've never looked at. So drawing is like the foundation of everything. I think all great artists can draw. So I think that's really, and I insist upon, you know, any young artists I talk to, they, I think they have to be able to draw. Drawing is like the foundation of everything. My work, my charcoal drawings are not really drawings, they're more like, charcoal paintings, you know, so it's, it's very different. Um, and I got a degree in sculpture because I think I had way too much, I was painting at the time, but I think I had way too much reverence for the history of painting. I mean, European painters, like, you know, to paint like Caravaggio or paint like Rembrandt, you'd have to study for like 20 years before you could paint like that. And I was really interested in making work. I wasn't interested in, in developing a technique, a craft. So, I mean, in contemporary art, there was, you have to realize American classical art is not Rembrandt and, you know, Cezanne, it's abstract expressionists. And that work was actually done pretty fast. If you look at a lot, a lot of American contemporary art, it's, it, it, there is this, like I, like I said, the American, the classical art of America is abstract expressionism. You know, so it, there are, so, Skill and ability is, is something that a lot of American artists don't really have, but I think over the years I've developed a really great skill with charcoal for sure. To back up, I'm dyslexic and I don't, I didn't start to read really until my 30s. So I looked at black and white television and newspapers and magazines. I read pictures, I didn't read books or magazines. So I'm from a generation that was, grew up on television you know, and movies. I mean, all the movies that I saw growing up were all these epic movies like Ben-Hur, you know, Spartacus. And I think that's one reason why I make epic art. Men in the Cities was inspired kind of by a, a still from a Fassbender film where a man is being shot. And 
I didn't realize it at the time, but I just loved this incredibly beautiful gesture that was there. It was almost like a ballet. But I, I like this, Men in Cities became this psychotic impulse. It became the, the impulse between a gesture, like if, when you go to reach for something, I was drawing the, that point, Men in Cities is this point in between. It's not the beginning or the end, it's, it's the moment it ha So Men in the Cities are, are really interesting because Men in the Cities, those drawings happen every time you look at them. Which is interesting, these Abax guys, the way they paint is these paintings happen every time you look at them. Every time you look here, you see this brush stroke. So there's a similarity between, them. and also Men in the Cities were never meant to be like figurative. They were, to me, incredibly abstract symbols. I think viewers on one hand wants to, want to see expression. That's why I love to see a brush stroke with trippy paint. On the other hand, I'm always very confused that do you want your car to look like that? So on one hand we want to see expression, but at the time we also want to see perfection. So I think with my work, if, if you look really closely, you'll see expression, but, but it's also it's perfect like a car. I mean, there's a there's a weird dichotomy that, that goes on there. And, and skills, like, I, think, I think art has to have a wow factor. You have to have this point where like, how did he do that? That's, I think that's really important. Because the, it, has to separate, it has to separate itself from the everyday life. And what's interesting about charcoal drawings is that, is that with my other work, People come in and they see the work and they go, they, they think they're photographs and then you, then you tell them that charcoal's drawing, they go, oh, and they look and it's a way about how to slow down an image. Because a lot of these images that I work on, you see for a second and they're gone. And how do, you, how do I make these images accountable? Like this, this because I think about it, the amount of images that we see on a daily basis, that they go into us and they affect us and you don't realize it. And, and maybe by trying to slow these images down, you get a chance to look at them. So this show gave me a chance to take a break from that work, which was, I wanted to learn more about, I realized I didn't know so much about the Europeans. And when I did the American show in 2014, today I said, why don't you do Europeans? I go, oh, I don't really know you. I don't really know them. I don't really like them. You know, they also were really small, you know. And then about three years ago, I discovered I was reading about how in 1940 they discovered the cave paintings in Lascaux. And I went, holy shit. In 1940, right as the World War was the beginning, they, was, they found the beginning of art in a cave. <clears throat> and I thought the cave could also be a bomb shelter. And that and the idea that they've seen the. So then, ironically, after the end of the war, these guys are trying to reinvent art and they find out and they learned about these cave paintings. So I think the cave paintings had a huge influence on all these guys. So I thought what was interesting is that the Americans, the abstract expressionists were trying to reject Europe and after the world tried to destroy itself. And, and the Europeans actually experienced it, which is a very different thing, but they were trying to they used this oxymoron expression, let's begin again. They were trying to start over again. And they were trying to reject classical beauty, surrealism, man, uh, impressionism. You know, they were trying to reject everything and start again. I mean, Dubuffet is one of the main guys that really tried to do that. And the thing that was interesting is, is this idea of trying to work outside of the art system, so, but be so loud that the art system has to pay attention to you. you know? I did not know a lot of these artists, and so I did my research. And the thing is, the one of the, I guess, the best compliment one artist can, can, get, can give another artist is to say that you're jealous. And I'm really jealous of these guys. I'm jealous of Manzoni. I'm jealous of Pell. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm jealous that they had this freedom to do what they did. The other thing is that what I decided to do with this show is that um, I joke about it, but in America, if it's big, it's good. If it's big and shiny, it's really good, you know. So I Americanized a lot of these works. They made them much bigger than they really are. Like the Dubuffet is this big. I made it 
gigantic. I, the Manzoni is really small. I made it the size of a bed. The thing is also, this show is a historical construction. It's like not real. You could not have all these works together. Although I like the fact that these guys, a lot of these guys knew each other. Um, but the thing is, it, the show is, is like embedded with, with, uh, with, saturated with time. The time that it was made in, the time it took to make. Look, what's interesting is how long does it take to make a brush stroke versus how long it takes to draw a brush stroke. So one of the things I did when I would draw a brush stroke, sometimes I would add a drop shadow, a trompe l'oeil effect to make, so a painter doesn't do that, but I can do that in this drawing of the painting. So the paintings actually, I wanted the paintings look, to look real in that sense. So. I grew up seeing these, seeing abstract expressions in magazines, but they were black and white photographs. And the thing was, is interesting is, black and white images of these paintings aren't correct because a dark red and a dark blue is the same color. So I work from the color photographs to make these things. So these are highly sensitized translations into black and white. What I later found out was in the late 1800s, a lot of painters were very upset when they saw their paintings photographed. So they were making black and white copies of their paintings to be photographed. So, so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm I'm going back to something that I personally have a relationship to the, when I saw these uh, Jackson Pollock in black and white. So black and white, I think we dream in black and white. Maybe black and white is the truth, I, I don't know, but, but, but to turn them into black and white was like, was really a forensic, I, my, the, the drawings in the studios were cover, surrounded by color photographs. We are constantly referencing the color photograph to make sure that it, it made sense, you know? And so the thing is I'm trying to make the most perfect version of these drawings in black and white, which is an interesting one. Also, what was strange is that I had this black and white catalog that was sent, of call, I think it's called the 13 Americans. It was an exhibition that was organized by um, the government in the United States that was called the American Service Organization. And it was sent to Europe. It was sent to mostly like the countries on the, the far, like, like in Germany, Austria, it was in Fran it was in France and it was in England, but what it was was an exhibition that was sponsored by this organization of the government called the American Service Organization, which was really the CIA. So the CIA was using abstract expressionism as a form of propaganda to show the people in the in the East what freedom looked like because they were forced to be doing social realism. Like you know, Richter and Boslin saw these shows. They, and that's what set them free, and it was interesting, but I think what's interesting about these guys is they were, this, this group of artists were kind of crushed between the totalitarianism of S Soviets and the Americans being so happy they were triumphant, and they were about to export, you know, commercialism and mass media, and, you know, it's like being stuck in the middle, for sure, yeah. I think these artists really thought that art could heal. You know, I thought they really thought it could heal. It could heal the wounds of the Second World War. I mean, Walter Benjamin talks about, about how maybe art can heal the cures of our barbaric mentality. I mean, if you give a small history of art history, you have people painting on the caves of the wall, and then you have the tribe tell, tells them what to paint on the wall. Then you have the church tells you what to paint on the wall. Then you have the government tells you what to paint. And around 18th century, middle 18th century, all of a sudden, nobody's telling you what to do. And artists are freaking out what to make paintings of. And then what happens is that subject matter becomes the critical issue of art artists. And if you, the Musée d'Orsay is like a hallucination. If you walk through there, you see how the paint gets thicker and thicker and thicker, how paint becomes the medium. And, and when you look at abstract expressionists, abstract expressionists, the paint no longer services illusion. It is, it is the picture. And I think as a, in, at this time, right time as an artist, it's very hard to make something really truly new. I think the one thing you can actually hope for is that you make something that's somewhat real then you try to tell the truth.